you all for joining us today for this week's Pay Virtual panel on the topic of Atana Washing, Why Words Matter. Uh, my name is Tabitha Coulter and I'm PAVE's Director of Operations and your moderator for today's panel. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you today to our rock star panelist, Liza Dixon, who is a PhD candidate in the field of human-machine interaction with automated driving. Since she's the only panelist today, I thought it would be easier to just have her introduce herself. So Liza, if you could just tell the audience a little about yourself and your background, you know, maybe specifically what led to your interest in human factors and automated driving or an, an intro to what that really means. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. So you introduced me well. I'm a PhD candidate in human machine interaction and automated driving. And really, um, my family, like many others, has been impacted by tragic errors in human machine interaction. So over the past few years, my interest in vehicle automation began to grow. And when it came time to do my master's thesis for my usability engineering degree, I decided to focus on trust in partial automation. So level two systems, what's on road today? Because I really wanted to see um, firsthand how people are interacting with the technology and how they come to it for the first time. And what I saw actually was a lot of problems. So it really made me think about how we approach the technology and what kinds of things we might need to do to make sure the benefits of the technology are actually realized. And so now I'm working towards my PhD. My topic is specifically the influence of HMI and automated driving and what can be done to, um, as far as like the design of these systems, what can be done to improve interactions for appropriate reliance and ultimately for safety. That's awesome. Um, so now I want to dive into kind of like the title and this word that you've coined and has kind of spread all over Twitter and the internet. So how did you first come up with this concept of Atana washing and, you know, what does it really mean? Yeah, so it, it was somewhat random, to be honest. Um, I have a lot of um, discussions with various people in the industry, mainly on, on Twitter, as you cited. So during one of those exchanges, um, for the sake of brevity for making things short on Twitter, I felt like I needed a word for, yeah, for, for this exhausting sort of recurring problem that I was seeing, which is making automation appear to be more capable than it really is. And so the word that kind of came to mind was a ton of washing. And the initial reaction was quite positive. And after I thought about it, I felt like there, it was really worthy of some more thinking and a deeper exploration. So I remember like the next day I posted a Medium blog post about this. And then I, um, I even, I submitted like an op-ed to the New York Times. I just started throwing it different places. And then I decided like, no, I think this needs to be like, like sculpted a little bit better. better. So I like sat down for a full month and just dove into this topic and um, submitted for a publication as a, an independent researcher, yeah. And to be specific about what Atana washing is exactly, it is uh, making something appear to be more autonomous than it really is. So that means that you're overstating what the system can do in a reliable and inconsistent way in terms of functionality and or you're kind of understating the amount of human supervision required to operate the system effectively and safely. I know in your paper, you kind of compare that to the former movement with greenwashing and the sustainability mm -hmm. movement. Could you kind yes. of explain that background and that comparison for people who might not be familiar, like what that connection is? Exactly. So greenwashing is when you make something appear to be more environmentally friendly than it really is. And um, it's interesting because what greenwashing does is sort of stall meaningful progress towards the goal that it appears to represent, which is sustainability and a cleaner, greener future. And so when you're a ton of washing, you're kind of doing the same thing with vehicle automation or really any type of automation. So when you are um, overstating the abilities of a system uh, in, in, in our specific area of of automotive, it's an immediate uh, human factors and safety concern, but there's also like, a side of it that's a much broader business um, strategy issue where you have now lots of money invested in all of these ideas about uh, what, what the consumer should expect to be available to them. And this is kind of uh, built on a rocky foundation. And it's not really something that is um, a, a, a good idea in the long term. Yeah. So how can we kind of identify instances? of Atana washing? How do you know if it's maybe occurring? Are there signs that kind of signal that Atana washing may be going on or what does that look like? Yeah, I think 
basically you can identify this as uh, any instance where a driver assistance system is being called self-driving. So that would be a ton of washing and, and it's like most pure form. So um, we see this in the way that of course Tesla has chosen to name its systems. So uh, full self-driving um, because it requires constant human supervision. Uh, oftentimes, um, you know, these systems get covered by the media and for whatever reason, um, it, it could be a collision or a misuse of the system, but I've seen more than land, maybe feel in the car and the car is obviously not, it's a self-driving vehicle. So it's sort of a self-perpetuating problem. Um, and it, it can also be something that's behavioral. So sometimes we'll see a video online where someone uh, removes their hands from the wheel in a sort of an expressive way and says something like, look, it's, it's driving by itself. Yeah. I'm not doing anything. And this is um, effectively to give the impression that the ton of washing. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. So thinking about that importance of those driver assistance systems and what the human mm -hmm. involved knows, you know, what does the human driver's understanding or lack of understanding in the capability of these systems, how does that matter? You know, is it enough for these groups to just kind of give a warning about what that means or how can we help develop that understanding? Yeah, so I think um, warnings, systems or, or, or disclaimers are obviously, they're critical. Um, and as are good driver monitoring solutions in the vehicle, um, but they clearly have their limits and it would be a huge mistake to count on sort of warnings or, or any monitoring systems as a first line of defense because a driver that knows the limitations of the system and views the system as a supportive system, which needs supervision is uh, going to have a, not only a much more positive experience with the technology, a more pleasurable one, also a safer one. So um, that's a benefit for themselves and certainly for all road users at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking too about, um, you know, public perception and the way that we think about trust and, and when we think about the mm -hmm. way that these systems are described and everything. And um, I know, I think you mentioned it in your paper and we found it in some PAVE studies, but you know, people tend to think that it is possible to purchase a self-driving car today. And I think you talked about how a ton of washing might be related to that of, you know, when we talk about the way these things are described and then that leads to a false sense of people believing that they can, you know, purchase a self-driving car today. Absolutely. Um, so then I wanted to talk a little bit more about that trust. You have a graphic in your paper that uh, illustrates trust calibration and what happens when the human either over or under trust the system. Can you kind of describe that graph and that concept that it's helping to illustrate? Sure. So, so firstly, I will say that as it is cited in the paper, the graph is adapted from um, some other researchers, Lee and C, who are really famous in this area of automation. So this predates my own research, but I have adapted it for a ton of washing so I can illustrate sort of where it falls on the scale and, and what the danger of it is. So what the graph shows is how critical it is that the driver's level of trust is matched to the system's capability. So uh, a driver that has high trust in a system with low capability, this is an immediate risk to the driver, the passengers, other road users. Uh, and then on the other side of the scale, if you have a driver with really low trust and a highly capable system, you have a, a different kind of problem where uh, the driver might interfere with the system, for example, like an overcorrection of some kind. Um, or you may have a case where uh, the driver doesn't use the system at all. And that would be a really a loss of the benefit of the technology uh, should, should there be a highly capable automated system available. So the risk here is that a ton of washing does inflate the driver's level of trust and then puts them sort of in this unsafe zone in which their trust is not properly calibrated to the capabilities of the automation. So are there factors when we think about, you know, designing these automation or these assistance systems, um, are there factors that we can use when we design that can help amplify or mitigate the risk of a ton of washing in that miscalibrated trust issue? Yes, so um, when it comes to uh, engineering, we know that we cannot anticipate every 
every type of possible misuse or every kind of you know creatively awful dangerous thing a person might do behind a wheel um, but our task is to account for what is foreseeable so knowing this kind of underscores how critical again a good driver monitoring system or a DMS is um, no driver monitoring systems that we have right now are perfect. Certainly some are better than other, others. So for example, head and eye trackers and also capacitive sensors are thought to be the most ideal um, versus something like a torque sensor. But um, you know, these systems can also be designed in a way so that if the driver is triggering an, an excessive amount of warnings, the system will um, shut itself off and no longer allow the driver to activate it until the vehicle has been restarted at a later time. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting concept of like how the, the design and these aspects could go into it. So it kind exactly, of leads yeah. to a, yeah, a question we got from the um, audience sort of asking, you know, how do we know that the way that manufacturers, that media, that people are describing systems actually affects the way it's used? You know, is there research that helps prove that descriptions of things can lead to unsafe use or, you know, what's that connection when we look there? Yeah, so there are certainly um, some issues with this. There have been, there has been some um, research done on this topic. We've had, first of all, we've had plenty of hints in the decades of human automation interaction research across different domains. Um, and of course, um, very recently, AAA released the results of a study about the impact of information on consumer understanding of partial automation. So this indicated um, clearly the dangers here. Um, you know, in this study, the participants were given the exact same vehicle system to drive. The only difference was the information they had beforehand. Um, half of the participants drove a system that they called Autono Drive. The other half drove a system called Drive Assist. And those that were using the Autono Drive system engaged with in much more risky behaviors. So removing their hands from the wheel, being slower to respond to system warnings, and just a general um, not not acting in a way that was properly calibrated with the system. So um, there's this study, there are several other studies about, um, you know, the knowledge that's distributed at the dealership level is often really low about these systems. There's not really a clear um, training for the customer. And really the, the main issue is the, the generally low level of public knowledge about the technology. So people are not really um, empowered right now to even know what to ask when they go to buy a car like this. So that is um, a challenge and something that I think um, a lot of people are trying to do work on like paid. And this is a really valuable thing for the, the industry and the technology. Yeah. So not asking you to solve that issue, you know, on your own, but I am curious, you know, what you think are some of the best ways to address this problem of the ton of washing, you know, does that need to look like regulation? Could it be norms and culture? Like, how can we kind of meaningfully address this? Like, what would your ideal solution be? Yeah, well, it's, it's a multifaceted problem that would require multifaceted solutions. So I think, firstly, we, we do have regulation, which should, in theory, prevent a ton of washing from happening. So this is part of the Federal Trade Commission Act in Section 5. It has a very clear statement about deceptive advertising. Um, but uh, as we know, this, this is, uh, I don't, don't know who's in charge of enforcing that, but we don't often see this enforced. Um, and I'm not a legal expert, but I would say that in my opinion, a ton of washing would be in violation of that act. Um, I think also we have made some pro progress recently. Uh, the AP style book uh, addressing journalists about the language used to describe vehicle automation. Uh, we've seen different guidelines released by AAA, so offering some consensus that uh, of what these systems should be called. So if it's an assistive system, using that word assist in the name is ideal. Um, driver education, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, so the work PAVE is doing. And also, um, there's been a new campaign launched from NHTSA, so Your Car Needs You. So this is basically an, uh, well, I would call it an anti autonomous washing campaign, which emphasizes, again, the need for driver supervision in today's systems on road, because every system on road today does require full driver supervision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thinking too about naming, like you just briefly mentioned, we had a question from the audience that was asking about, you know, have the levels of automation that um, SAE defined in J3016, which we have a paved panel on, by the way, if you want to learn more about, 
Um, so have those levels of automation helped clarify or con confuse the community um, since those dimensions have been collapsed into a sing single scaler that, you know, as we know, the SE levels were kind of designed by and for engineers. So I think they're wondering how that has impacted the community when we think about automation. Yes, it absolutely has impacted the community. And I think, um, I think it kind of happened, I'm guessing, if I look back at history on when journalists just needed a graphic to throw into their uh, articles on their tight deadlines, and um, they were using this over and over. And it was really the only thing we had. It was the only tool we had. And, and you're very right when you say it's designed for engineers by engineers. Um, because it, it really is not something that you absorb at a glance. Most people don't realize that there is a, I think it's like over 80 pages PDF that goes with this uh, graph to explain exactly what, what they mean there. And um, it's it, not a graph, it's a chart. It's actually a taxonomy. So it's designed for, it's not a, people read it often as like a scale or a ladder and it's really a taxonomy. So it's, it's something to look at a system and then identify that system with. Um, but absolutely, it's created confusion. And as soon as someone sees a, a driver assistance system come out that has a new feature or, or a, like a new capability of some kind, they want to say it's a higher level of automation. And it's really not because those levels are, um, they're described by technical features, but when it comes down to them, and especially between level two, level three, level four, they are almost solely defined by the driver supervision. That's what's really separating them uh, on that graph scale <laughs> chart. Are you, are you referring a little bit when people use like a plus or like 0.5 and try to? Yes. Yeah. And this is also something that I actually talk about in the Atana washing paper where you have this L2 plus and these features are really designed to kind of make up for a lack of progress. Like the progress that was promised that kind of isn't being realized fully. It's something to um, kind of give the illusion that the technology is getting pushed forward and, and advancing when really it's, um, there are a lot of issues that we need to resolve. Yeah, I just saw, we just got a question in the Q&A by somebody um, asking if it seems like a ton of washing could happen by what AV developers are not saying. So kind of, is it, can a ton mm -hmm. of washing happen by mission or is it only by what's being said concretely? Sure. Well, I would say, I mean, it, it does happen on a spectrum. Um, and I think it's definitely the most, uh, the boldest versions of this is what is said. And it is th the best defense against a ton of washing is education. So um, certainly the more descript descriptive people can be about the system and specifically its limitations and the need for uh, driver supervision, this is really what's most critical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's a really great thing. Um, I'm just curious too, are there other, other issues related to Tana washing and trust calibration when we're thinking about those human assistive systems? Are there other issues that you're thinking about in this area? Yes, so I think um, now and kind of going into the future, we have uh, more uh, manufacturers uh, adopting these over the air updates. So these present a challenge, I think, for both drivers and for system designers. So if you have, if you have a vehicle that is going to become more capable literally overnight in your garage but not more autonomous so meaning that you still have to supervise it it can really kind of mess with the driver vehicle relationship and with trust so i think it's going to be interesting to see what happens here as more makers switch to this model of uh system updates and i think it just again further underscores the need for good driver monitoring so um which we're seeing now in these newer systems that m most of the new systems that are coming out do have head and eye trackers and uh, these things so this is great awesome yeah. um do you have any suggested reading for anybody who you know maybe they just heard about a ton of washing for the first time and they want to learn more about it or learn more about this topic do you have any suggestions for how they could do Okay, sorry, there was a little delay. Um, yeah, so of course you can go to autonowashing.com and, and start with the paper if you like, no problem. But I know that PAVE also has been working to develop a literature database of their own. So I think this is really cool and this is a really good place to start. But if you're interested maybe in a really specific topic such as automation complacency or trust and automation, I mean, if you're feeling, uh, you know, really nerdy and you want to join me on the dark side, you can go to Google Scholar and uh, put in those keywords and you'll find um, really so many amazing scientists who have been working in this area 
far long, longer than I have, who have really uh, for decades set the foundation for what we know today about humans and this technology. And um, it, it's, you know, people think of science as chemistry or biology and stuff. And this is really, this really is a science. And when you hear someone who um, is working in this area, you know, we're not just guessing or giving opinions. Um, when we're critical about the things we see happening on the road, we're just here to kind of echo the science. Yeah. I was curious too, like what your takeaway would be for people who, again, kind of have just learned about this idea. Like, what do you hope that learning about a tunnel washing, how do you hope that empowers them to go about these conversations and their own education in the future? Yeah, so I think my kind of dream for this word Atana washing, really what I see it as is sort of, it's a tool. So we could sit here and talk for uh, an hour about this, the problem that is making something appear to be more autonomous than it really is. And we could write pages about it. And in fact, that's kind of what was happening prior to now. But with this word um, and with all language as we develop as people, as humans, it, it helps us to progress. It helps us to move forward and to, um, you know, it, it, create the future. So I think um, I would just like for that, the word to um, make people ask more questions about the technology, like be suspicious of the things they're, they're hearing and seeing online and um, just, just keep asking questions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so one, we just got another question in the chat too. Um, mm -hmm. I was curious, like this is important as we're ongoing with tech development with AVs, but even for kind of ADAS and like what we're seeing on the road today, um, she's asking like, how do we eradicate autonomous washing on tech that's already out there, that's already being used by people? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's the cat is out of the bag. So we're all faced with this reality where, where this is kind of going on. And I think it's just, um, like I said, it's education and it's asking questions. It's, it's being suspicious of the things that you hear when something sounds really good and really exciting, you know, full self-driving and da da da, then you should look into it and understand, like ask the questions, what are the limitations of the system? Is the driver required to monitor? Those are really the two, uh, key things to take note of. Yeah. Um, on a kind of personal side, like your ability to have gotten into this issue and gotten into this topic is, we think at PAVE, you know, really inspiring. And so we, from an education side point, we were first, uh, curious, like what advice you would give to people, you know, especially maybe younger people, about how to get involved with these kind of issues and make an impact on the future of technology. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, I think I think especially right now because of uh, COVID, a lot of people feel like you know they're being held back in some way, either by geography or because they're looking for work and having a hard time finding it. And those those are real issues, but they are not things that actually affect your ability to make an impact, not in 2020. So I want younger people and older people alike <laughs> to know that they can make an impact really right now where they are. So I think it's really about uh, making a choice and taking a risk to say to yourself, okay, like I'm gonna make an impact and looking at your strengths and how you can use those to express something that really matters to you. I think, you know, in my case, I had never worked in the automotive industry before when I published this paper. Um, I was not living in a large urban center. I really just used um, scientific information that was available to me on the internet and my social network to create something new. And um, I think it's a mistake to think that people that you see out in the world that you would say are making an impact have any kind of like magical quality or doing something that's out of reach in some way. I think it's just a matter of tapping into something that you're really passionate about and committing your focus to it. So, I mean, if you, if you think you can't do it, then you're right. So you should think that, yeah, you can. Yeah, that's really great and really helpful. And I definitely encourage anybody on here to, you know, like she mentioned, you know, go to her website, follow her directly on Twitter, um, check out our kind of paved resources. Um, we're getting kind of close to the end of time anyway, so I might kind of go ahead and wrap up unless you have any other kind of final, you know, thoughts or things that you'd like to leave the audience with related to this concept. Just be, be the, um, the suspicious one <laughs> about this technology. Please uh, keep, drive safely, keep your eyes on the road, your hands on the wheel, unless you have a hands-free system like Super Cruise. These are uh, quite rare. Most of the systems are hands-on right now, but please just drive safe. Great. Thank you so much.
much. Well, that brings us to the end of our time today. And so thank you so much for joining me and, you know, paid for this weekly discussion. And if you'd like to learn more about Liza and her research, you can check out the bottom of the confirmation email we sent this morning. Actually, it has a link to all of her publications. Um, you can also go to our resource library at pavecampaign.org slash resources and type in her name or Tana Washing and you'll see the things she mentioned there. Or follow her directly on Twitter at Liza Dixon, um, D-I-X-O-N, that's her last name. Um, <laughs> Anyways, thank you all so much. And Liza, thanks for joining. And thank you all. Um, we hope you join us next week for our discussion. It'll feature panelists from Waymo, the Chandler, Arizona Police Department, and Arizona DOT. And we're pretty sure it's going to be a good one. Uh, registration will be live on our website tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, thank you all. And thank you again, Liza. Thank you.